the mm. biggest thing right now, and it's it's something that I'm actively fighting against, mm. is fear uh, of doing <laughs> less in the next one, uh, or yeah. not, not doing as well. So a lot of pressure. Our Metacritic has been going up, right. and so we're at 96 now. Right. And nice. so there's like, uh, we need to do better. And I said, like, you, got, you got, just got to forget about it and follow your gut feeling, right? right? But just don't try to perfection everything, because otherwise you're not going to get anything done anymore. Fear, I get it. First, Baldur's Gate is a very huge name. But <laughs> Baldur's Gate is a huge name of 20 years ago. Baldur's Gate had an existing fan base. And in fact, a lot of this fan base was very negative towards Larian when during the early access. There were so many people saying that uh, Baldur's Gate 3 looked like a divinity copy and all this. Of course, all those silly opinions, they went away once everyone actually got to play Baldur's Gate. But two weeks before the release of Baldur's Gate, I decided to replay Baldur's Gate 2. And a few days before the release of Baldur's Gate, I was really worried. Because one of the things that I really loved about Baldur's Gate 2 is that there were lots of lo lovely little things to do everywhere. You know, the NPCs would literally line up and give you quests and you had so much to do in that game and there were little things ever. And, and I had a lot of trouble trying to conceptualize that something like this would be viable in, in a game that looks like Baldur's Gate, in a game with so many cutscenes, in a game with so much production, like how, how the fuck will they pull it off, right? I was afraid that Baldur's Gate wouldn't be able to have such flexibility, but I was very happy and very impressed with the amount of content that they could put in the game. So it was definitely valid that a lot of people were questioning what Larian were doing because let's face it, nothing like this has ever been done. Part of the reason a lot of people talk about the upper city content of Baldur's Gate that they ended up you know, changing things, they pro they probably realized, yes, we we can possibly do things like this, but maybe we can implement those things in other, uh, the, the, the good ideas of this place in other regions of the game and do something different and better. Or, or, or they also thought we're already spending six years on this project. L we need, we need to show this to the world because they could always keep, you know, adding things to it and they ne would never have a, stop a stopping point. The first game that comes into mind when it comes to feature creep, creep is Star Citizen. Having a limit on how much you perfect and do something is important. And by no means Baldur's Gate is perfect, right? It's, it definitely went above and beyond, but there is no perfect game out there. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And just because I bring a game up, doesn't mean it's bad that you like it. I mean, I have a friend that likes to dip popcorn in ketchup and then eat it. But for example, there's a lot of safe games out there. For example, Horizon Zero Dawn. Horizon Zero Dawn doesn't bring anything new to the table. Horizon Zero Dawn is a game that feels like it's designed to not fail. The only problem with it is that it always releases around Elden Ring or something bigger. The game just doesn't innovate. Another extreme game in the line would be Death Stranding. Death Stranding is a game that innovates, some would even say too much, and, and it's crazy. And I, I don't even know how Kojima managed people to fund his games because even though I, I did like playing Death Stranding, I don't know how the hell you would convince somebody that this idea is good like uh, yeah let's just make a an amazon delivery simulator and trust me bro it's gonna be good it, it's like vanilla if vanilla was a flavor for gaming it would be something around horizon zero now and then there is death stranding that's like probably probably the sweet uh, swedish uh banana and curry pizza so there's a few things where in the industry of making video games that uh, w you know the people will receive well. When they made Baldur's Gate, I mean, you can see how much work they put into the game and you can see how well the game did, but we are looking at a success story. Imagine if this success didn't happen. Would Larian just close down as a studio? CRPGs and 
turn-based games have not been big in 20 years or so. And they still believed in what they were doing and they went full win. It did pay off for them, but a lot of times it doesn't pay off. A lot of times it doesn't work out. Now, Larian has probably two big fears, right? They know that part of the people heard of Baldur's Gate because of the old times. Part of the people, or most people, I would say, uh, heard from Baldur's Gate because they were probably in a way turned on by a vampire or getting pounded by a bear that was a druid. And then there were the people who, you know, just decided to give the game of a style that they'd never seen before and take a chance. We're all valid. That's okay. But here's the thing. Will those people want to stay for something that's not Baldur's Gate? Will those people want to interact with characters that are not Asterian, they're not Shadowheart, there's other people? Will those people be able to fall in love with other things? It's a risk. No. They can't know. We don't know. We can't know. <laughs> so I will personally try whatever they they release because I have been doing that even before Baldur's Gate because I have been a fan of their work for a while. But I don't know. I can speak for everybody else. It could be that they do something and people even like it better because it, it's not tied to a system that like, for example, Dungeons and Dragons, because one could say, uh, I will, I, I never tried Baldur's Gate. I'll never play Baldur's Gate because I never liked Dungeons and Dragons. I never understood Dungeons and Dragons. So, you know, fuck that game. There could have been people like that. I have to do similar things as a streamer. I know that vast majority of my audience loves Baldur's Gate 3. So sometimes when I'm trying to play a game on stream, I know that some of you are here because you like the silly and the dumb shit I say all the time. But some of you might be here for the game. And, and, and that's fine. So sometimes finding the perfect balance between something that's familiar and something that is not is very difficult. Do you foresee yourself following a similar like development process as you did with Early GD3? Access? Because it was quite unlike most other development processes. My, my GDC talk uh, showed the, the initial design, uh, part of the initial design doc mm. that we had to supply to Wizards of the Coast. And uh, it said like, you know what, we're just going to make Act 1, we're going to put it in Early Access, we're going to see what players think about it, and mm. then we're going to make Act 2 and 3, so we'll figure it out. So you, I wouldn't be surprised, although plans can change, that we do exactly that. Okay. That we just... I know that a lot of people do not like that the early access was only for the first act. But honestly, I think it's the best they can do. Because even though by year three, I was very tired of act one, when, when Baldur's Gate 3 released, there were still new and exciting things to see in act one. Uh, and I was really looking forward to Act 2 and 3. Maybe if they had put the early access that you could see everything as they made, I would be tired of the entire game when the game came out. I bought Baldur's Gate on early access as soon as it came. I was so excited to play that game that I did possibly the dumbest thing I have ever done being so excited to do something that you start crying like a little bitch for half an hour so you cannot do the thing you was really excited to do that was play the thing but it was the first time in my life that i actually cried of excitement i just was so overwhelmed with excitement that excitement started coming out of my 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 tear ducts and and i was just like oh, i'm so excited to play fantasy i'm sitting here crying like a little bitch because i'm so excited i can do it right now because it's right in front of me i can't play because i'm so excited i still don't understand what happened that day i'm i'm thankful it comes out of my tear ducts because imagine if i just started peeing instead i would actually need to use game of Darpers. For a lot of them, was the first RPG they've ever played, and the first love is always special. Yeah. Uh, but it took long. Uh, six years is too long. Uh, so we we we. Tr six years to make this is too long. I would have expected a game like this should take longer than six years. And also during COVID, 
Can you guys believe that this game somehow worked out? And two of those six years were COVID years? If you have a very focused and inspired team that really wants to get things done and they have their vision and they actually progress. I visited the Keyback Larian studio in January of last year. From what I talked to everybody there, crunching was not a thing. Nobody was staying late. So how the hell are they working on a game for six years? I feel like a term that is talked in the industry is Bioware magic. Bioware magic was basically cr crunching you know, cr and staying late and, and all this in, in the last road. And it seems like Larian didn't do that. So you're telling me that, that they are somehow working during all those six years without crunching, but dividing their work and their timelines properly? How they're doing that? I never heard of this before. Is this how it goes in healthy work environments? I really feel like sometimes maybe they, they made a, a deal with a devil or something. There is very few people that realize that when people are rested and treated well, they're more likely to do a good job. But it could be that he's not actually downplaying it. It could be that it's the normal for him. And since he never worked in any other company, he doesn't know what, what it is there. They actually decided to release the game. It was almost a month before their date. Before their announced date. And usually in this industry, delays are the expected. You guys, the more that we talk about this, the more it seems like there was a devil contract involved. But here's the thing. I actually brought the theory to Sven myself. And I asked him, Sven... Did you make a contract with a devil? Is that why you could make a game this fast, this good, and, and release it 20, almost a month earlier? And he said, no, we could do this because we did not do a contract with the devil. That's what he told me then. How do you feel about people aspiring to make games like Baldur's Gate 3? Well, I hope somebody makes one so I can play it without knowing the story. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Uh, I started this company because I wanted to make games that I want to play. Right. There. That's it. That's, that's it. That's what we need more of. We need somebody to start gaming companies because they want to make games that they want to play that do not exist. Uh, we have people uh, that have relatives and friends in Ukraine. We need to help them. Uh, oh. So our entire operations team essentially went into uh, incredible uh, amount of work in terms of relocating. Uh. Okay, again. Six years, they created a game like this, they went through COVID, they went through closing an entire studio and helping everybody from that studio move to a different country. I'm starting to think that Larian has a time machine. So okay. this was part of a, a, a larger plan that I have towards what I call the very big RPG that will dwarf them all. Oh, uh, so Baldur's Gate isn't that RPG. No, 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 oh. no, no. I think Sven actually wants to rule the world. And he's making good games to distract us from his evil plans. When Baldur's Gate 3 came out, I did not live, leave the door of my house for three months. Uber Eats was really happy with me. So if he makes this master plan RPG to rule them out, how long will I go without leaving my house? And then it will not be just me, it's gonna be all of us. And then, he can just rule the world! We will just be busy playing the RPG, he's trying to create the Matrix. He literally just told us, live on camera. And we're just nodding, bring it on, the world sucks. We need escape, come on Sven! Hurry up! Everybody was telling you, you got to make DLC. And really, you should be starting on a sequel. Right? This is so successful, it makes yeah. so much money. And so for, for a while, I was actually, uh, I say, yeah, yeah, that's what we should be doing. Uh, later in the year, I realized, well, that's not what we're made for. I mean, right. that's literally the opposite of what Laren is about. Uh, we want to do big new things. We don't want to rehash the thing that we've done already. Mm. Uh, so that's when we said, oh, we're not going to do that. How can you 
agree and disagree with somebody at the same time? Is that possible? Like, it's like my soul agrees, but my heart disagrees. Like, I get it, but... No. It's not about milking, but it's about expanding on something, you know? There's a few good examples I can bring. The first DLC of The Witcher 3, it's a very concise DLC. It, it has a very tightly knit story, a great narrative. It's, it's good. It's so good. And, and the good thing about the DLC is that it doesn't require you to play the base game to, to fully appreciate it. It's like a side thing. A lot of times whenever people bring up that they couldn't get into The Witcher, I would tell them to just try to play the first DLC. If they like it, then they should stick to the game. Second is The, the Witcher's second DLC, Blood and Wine. It could have been a full new game, you know? And the funny thing about Blood and Wine is that if you tell me which of the Witcher DLCs I prefer, I can tell you. Because I like them both, and they, they do really great things in very different ways. I feel like expanding on a good project, if it's done well, it's achievable. It, it has nothing to do with milking. Another good example is the, the, the Cyberpunk DLC. There's many other. DLCs, they can be really good. It's just that most people think of EA DLCs. Maybe making something short, shorter than a full game and concise, could also give you experience to maybe make an RPG to, to dwarf them all, you know? Because maybe part of making an RPG to dwarf them all is add content to it over time small things that change and affect the world. Let's think of Baldur's Gate, okay? Because it's the main topic. Imagine if there was an update or something that you could go back to Act 2 and it could either vary between the players who restored the world and the players who didn't restore the world. And you just have a few things and a few things to do after that has happened. Depending on your, on your end world, you see a little bit of progression of a place. I am just saying that DLCs are not exactly just milking something. But, but that's why I agree that yes, Larian should do new things and exciting things. So why don't you reinvent a DLC? Make something new. Get something that people are not expecting. I'm just an outsider. They have made their decision. I, I just really love Baldur's Gate. And part of me is having a lot of trouble letting it go. But at the same time, I'm very thankful for them to making the best game I ever played. And again, I can't wait to see next. It's literally a problem of letting go. I think my favorite game before Baldur's Game was The Witcher 3. And I find that the goodbye that I got from Blood and Wine was a beautiful goodbye to the game. It made me cry on stream and then I finished my stream and then I, I went on crying for a few more hours, but it felt like it was the perfect way to say goodbye. It felt that it was right to let go. And I, I am going to be excited for whatever the hell they bring. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I, I know that they work with all their heart and and that's the only thing that I agree to disagree, you know? Again, I, 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 I completely trust him. And I, I know that whatever else they will work on is going to be good. And I'm going to love it. And, but again, I 
feel that something as good as Baldur's Gate maybe deserves a proper goodbye. Especially from somebody that waited 20 years for this game. It's my personal thing. I'm just having trouble to just letting go. I know that they say that they didn't finish the updates for Baldur's Gate, you know? I understand. I do. But then, I must be honest with you guys. I would hate to see Larry and, and all those passionate people work on something they don't want to work. So I'm very torn. And I know there's a lot of you blaming Hasbro and, and other things, but I don't think they made their decision based on one thing. They probably weighted a bunch of pros and cons, they put them in a balance, and, and there were multiple reasons in both sides for them. I feel like if you could name one single thing that would be simplifying a great decision that we were not part of. From Divinity Original Sin 1 to Divinity Original Sin 2, there is a clear improvement. And, uh, and the game definitely has a jump, you know? And they improve in so many different aspects of the game that it goes from them making a good game, that's Divinity 1, to them making what was possibly the first game that I thought it was closer to a masterpiece. Even though, yes, the game has a lot of flaws, but given the time given the tools at the moment it was a really good game i just can't possibly imagine how do you make something better than this because i couldn't possibly imagine baldur's gate before baldur's gate you know uh in a way baldur's gate has ruined other games in so many different aspects for me, it's both a blessing and a curse. A blessing that we get to play something so good and a curse because in a way it makes everything else worse. How do you leap from that? I mean, I'm not saying that Baldur's Gate is perfect. It's clearly not. You can definitely make it better. But can you leap from it? Everyone right now is like games. Mm -hmm. Making games is it's the worst time to be making games. Um, do you is it the worst time to be making games? I would say it's one of the best times to be making games. Uh, specifically in, in 2009, which was one of our darkest days, uh, right. when uh, you had the economic crisis, uh, the business model had changed also, like, because people were making lots of derivative work. Uh, like there were 500 versions of My Little Pony. Uh... <laughs> he brought up My Little Pony? <laughs> he said that his worst time was 2009 and they started making Baldur's Gate 3 in 2018 so that was almost 10 years I am really glad that even though things were really hard that they had enough confidence in themselves that they pushed through those hard times because if they didn't we would never have something like Baldur's Gate so sometimes when life kicks you in the butt, just just keep pushing, you know? You don't know where you, lead, you will end up down the road. Or I think you're going to see uh, quite a lot of new studios form. Uh, right. Out of that, you will see a lot of gameplay. They will create job opportunities. People. That's a good point. Do you guys know one of the people who got fired in this entire firing dev wave? The person who created Boo and Minsk and the Joker from Mass Effect. Those are some of my favorite video game characters ever. And that person got laid off by Bioware as one of the people who got laid off. That person is a hero. So what we need to do now is hope that those people who created so many amazing things in video games that they find a proper home that will appreciate them and, and give them room to create more. Ooh, Maybe they can group together and so make something really cool and crazy. just like Larian, we'll see other companies surging from other situations like this. But Sven, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you coming and giving us some insight Ooh. into... You know
We're done. We watched it. God, that was very insightful. Emotionally intense. Uh, when I talked to Sven, I told him that I played, I, I spent a lot of time stuck at home playing video games. And my parents would say, you know, outside is too dangerous. No. And since the outside was always so dangerous, I, I just played a lot of video games. And, and now that I can go outside, I, I just prefer staying inside playing video games anyways. <laughs> and, and he said that when he was young, it, it was quite, he was in a similar situation where he, he was also stuck at home a lot of the time and there was no computers. So he would actually make like uh, board games and games, but you know, physically. And uh, I think he, he knows what he's doing. And I think, I don't think, I know he does it with a lot of heart, even though I'm not ready to say, to let go of Baldur's Gate. And it does hurt me that a DLC or something like this is not coming for Baldur's Gate. I understand and I trust him and I know Larian will do their best and I do hope that they love doing what they're doing because if that's the case I'm going to love playing it too. We are definitely going to be in the first row <laughs> for whatever it is next. <laughs>